Welcome back. So, here we are again, still on the trail of an elusive map, and we still seem to hear the same arguments going nowhere fast. So what are we to do? As I've mentioned a couple of times, we don't need a map, but it's a nice thing to have. And anyone who's taken a mild interest in the matter will probably have seen enough maps to last them a lifetime. I also recall saying that none of us, myself included, are likely to go out and create a new map of the world anytime soon. But of all the maps that are kicking around, we can probably get a good idea of what's out there. So I'll cut to the chase. Back in episode 6, I showed why I think that the only maps that might help us are the circular maps where it's back to the globe again. The dew line across the top of Canada seems to preclude all the flat maps that have the North Pole at the edge or at one of the corners. If you believe that the world is flat, I would suggest that the circular layout is the only one that gives us a start point. So let's pick this up where we left off. The circular layout seems to date as far back as 1781. That's the oldest reliable map that I can find so far, and it seems like as good a start point as any other. The layout seems to have a fairly consistent track record. So let's dig a bit deeper. I'm going to use Alex Gleason's map again, because it's still the cleanest map that I can find, and I think it still has a few more treasures for us to find. Aside from being a fairly clean map, Alex Gleason's map is also quite distinctive that big red border around the edge tends to make it stand out from the others. And perhaps it's because it is rather distinctive that people tend to name this one when the circular map is called into question. You've all heard the disparaging remarks where people have variously referred to it as the Lil Pizza Pan model or the Lil Snow Globe map, and presumably in some vain attempt to discourage people from using it. Before I go any further, I'd like to provide a caveat. I know there are problems with making a final map. One quarter of the known world is effectively out of bounds. Many flat earthers still seem reluctant to accept any model, but we shouldn't let it deter us from working to solve as much of the puzzle as we can. Some people do prefer to have something to work with, and for that reason, we look closer. Alex Gleason created his map at the end of the 19th century as the basis for a timekeeping device that he patented. I'll deal with the layout in detail in a moment, but I invite you to pause for a moment and think how many agencies use this layout already. There certainly seems to be something in it. It seems that many of the critics direct their objections at Alex Gleason rather than the layout itself. If anyone still thinks this map is so grossly wrong, I would challenge them to go and bang on the door of the United Nations and ask them why they have a Lil Pizza Pan map for so many of their agencies. I recall saying some time ago that some men really do have a thing about size, and as such, do any of us really think any country would have allowed themselves to be portrayed as significantly smaller than they or their neighbours really are? It seems unlikely, so the UN map might be a fairly good indicator that we're on the right track. If we take a look at Alex Gleason's map, we can see that it was created as the basis for a timekeeping device that he patented in the 1890s. Unfortunately, it seems like the copy we have is the only surviving original, courtesy of the Boston Library. It's a little trashed, but if you do a patent search, it's fairly easy to see exactly what its purpose was. The map, which forms the central section of the chart, was created by one J.S. Christopher, but there seems to be no information available about this particular individual. Any claim that modern college is a misspelling of Morden College, which is just outside London, is equally credible given that the map appears to have been designed in England and then printed in the United States. It's not unreasonable for the US printers to have assumed that Morden was a misspelling 
and to have made the correction themselves. In either case, Morden College was originally opened, quote, for the poor merchants and such as have lost their estates by accidents, dangers and perils of the seas. So it's quite reasonable to conclude that whoever J.S. Christopher was, he or she is quite likely to have had some considerable experience of the oceans and the mass of the world. And while the critics of Morden College now seem to paint it as being full of dribbling pensioners, it has a very credible pedigree linked to world navigation. I've trimmed Alex Gleason's chart as far as the border because I thought it might be nice to see exactly what Alex Gleason did create and in the hope that it will provide a solid point from which we can take a closer look. In the top left hand corner Alex Gleason states that the chart is a longitude and time calculator. If you do a patent search you can find these instructions for yourself but I'll ask you to accept my assertions for a moment and I'll put the patent application at the end for those of you who would like to see it a little closer. The chart was originally built with two arms that are pivoted near the center. They look like they're slightly off center but a closer look will show that they're fixed this way so that the scales on each arm run directly from the center of the map along the lines of longitude. Essentially, both arms are the same and each one has a scale that's divided into sections to represent latitude markings and working in both directions from a zero point at the equator. Around the outside of the chart is a scale that shows longitude markers in five degree steps and longitude lines at 15 degree intervals. So the first function of the chart to calculate the longitude for any location needs that we simply rotate one of the arms so that the graded edge runs through the location that we're looking at. The exact location can then be read off the chart as a coordinate. By way of an example, let's suppose we use Philadelphia in North America. By rotating one of the arms round so that it runs through Philadelphia, we can see from the main grid that it stands on the 75 degree line. And by reading the latitude marking from the scale on the arm, we can see that it lies at a latitude of 40 degrees north. The full coordinates for Philadelphia are longitude 75 degrees west and latitude 40 degrees north. It really is that simple. The time calculator is just as easy, almost painfully easy. Take any two locations on the map that you want to compare and rotate each of the arms so that one arm runs through each location. The tips of the arms end at the clock scale around the edge, so the time difference between the two locations is shown by counting the numbers of hours between the two arms. Again, by way of an example, let's suppose we want to compare London and Philadelphia. If we rotate the arms so that one rests over each location and count the hours between them, we'll see that they are five hours apart. The calculation part comes by using the scale around the outside edge like a clock. A spring washer keeps the arms the same distance apart, in this case five hours. I'll assume that we're in London at 3pm and rotate the arms so that the later arm is moved to 3pm on the clock dial and the Philadelphia arm will show that the time there is 10am. Remember, some countries use daylight savings time. As complicated as it may have appeared, Alex Gleason's time chart really is that simple. In fact, if you take a look at the patent application, he states that it really is simple enough for a child to use and no harder than reading the time from the face of a clock. If you take a closer look at the patent application, you'll notice that the accompanying map doesn't have quite as much detail as the poster version that most of us have seen. I can only hazard a guess as to why there's so much more information on the poster version, but given that no one else seems to have staked any claim to it, I'm inclined to believe that it was developed a little further when the poster version was produced to include some of the additional information around the main layout. 
Alex Gleason also seems to have been sufficiently satisfied that the entire layout was his invention, to have placed his name at the top, and to add the title that it serves as a new standard map of the world. As I said a moment ago, Alex Gleason's map is remarkable largely because it's quite distinctive. It seems that much of the opposition appears to be directed at Alex Gleason rather than the layout itself. So let's see if we can take some of the heat out of it and concentrate on the facts. The best copy that we have has the remains of one of the original arms. A nice touch, but a bit of a distraction for our purposes, so let's get rid of the arm and clean it up a bit. If we trim all the extras away, we can concentrate on the map itself. And if I trace the layout, we can pull the map away and it's no longer Alex Gleason's map. In fact, it's nobody's map now. All I want to preserve is the layout of the land masses themselves. I'll explain why in a moment. I've also taken the liberty of putting Mount Maru back at the North Pole as an alternative to the blank, empty space that the globe seems to suggest. Much of the detail comes from Mercator's maps of the 16th century, while modern science seems to suggest that the North Pole has sunk in the last 500 years, and Father Christmas has moved his elves and his operational headquarters to Lapland. We now have what is generically referred to as an azimuthal equidistant projection, and I'm quite particular to use that word at this stage, because in Alex Gleason's patent application, he states that the longitude lines from the globe have simply been straightened out. So let's take this one step at a time and not judge him too harshly. We have a flat disk that shows the land masses around the world. For our purposes, it's as good as any other map of the world. It shows the principal land masses in relation to each other, and it's flat. So I'd like to call Alex Gleason up one last time before we let him rest in peace and take a closer look at his patent application. When someone files a patent application, the date that it's filed is recorded to avoid people stealing an idea while an application is processed or pending. As such, the date that a patent is filed and the date that it's finally allowed to stand are usually some time apart. It's the date allowed that matters most because it's the earliest date that the invention is considered to exist. The more eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that the application date and the allowed date are some six months apart. Now you know why. If you want to patent something that includes parts that were invented by someone else, you must cite the patent number for each of those parts. You can't put a new patent on someone else's invention. You can only patent your own bits. When you apply for a patent, your application must cite the patent numbers for any part of your design that was made by someone else. At the bottom of many patent applications, you will see the numbers for those patents that are cited. So let's see if anyone else thinks Alex Gleason's layout is credible. If you run a search on the internet using Alex Gleason's patent number, you'll find that there are three patents that use his map. All granted in the 1970s for a device called a Universal Planisphere Complete Guidance and Computer System that was invented by one William A. Eisenhower. A planisphere is a flat map of a spherical surface. A planisphere and a globe both show the same information except that one of them is flat and the other is spherical. If you believe that the Earth is flat, it's reasonable to accept that a planisphere serves the same purpose as the globe does for those who still think we live on a little ball. That's your decision to make. The planispheres we've seen so far are all maps of the ground, so I'd like to step away from ground maps for a moment and set our sights a little higher. Several thousand miles higher to be precise. In the same way that the flat, circular world has been wrapped around a ball to provide us with a model for the globe, the skies have also been portrayed as a sphere that surrounds the globe. And in the same way that a globe can be shown as a flat, circular map, 
so too can the skies. I know that many people, especially flat earthers, will shout that the skies don't tell us anything about the earth on which we live, but I would beg to differ. The sky, and specifically the sun, the moon and the stars, have long been used in navigation to tell us exactly where we are on the surface of the earth. If we know exactly where the sun, moon and stars are on any date and time, it's fairly easy to establish your exact position on the face of the earth. They provide us with a reference system. In the same way that the ground can be mapped as a planisphere, so too can the skies, and when the two are used together, they provide an extremely reliable indicator of exactly where you are on the face of the earth. So I invite you to think about how we navigate around the world. Most people accept that GPS and local maps will generally get you from A to B. But let's remember that GPS is a fairly modern invention. On the land, navigation is fairly straightforward. In towns and cities we follow roads and landmarks, and out in the open countryside where there are few recognisable points of reference we use a map and compass. Every good navigator knows that following a compass needle seems like a good idea but that it's practically impossible to keep a steady compass while you walk. The correct method to navigate with a compass is to take general compass direction from the map, let the compass point in that direction, and pick a landmark to which the compass is pointing. Navigation is then as simple as walking to that landmark, and any route over the land is simply a case of walking from point to point until you get to your destination. On the oceans, navigation is a little more precarious because there are no recognisable landmarks. The earliest navigation over the seas relied on staying within sighting distance of the land masses. The magnetic compass began to be used for navigation at sea around a thousand years ago, but wind and sea currents meant that sailing by the compass, or dead reckoning, was still quite hazardous for the navigator until reliable clocks were invented in the 18th century. As such, there was very little by which a navigator could be sure of his position on the oceans except for using the sun, the moon and the stars. They are sufficient to help navigators across the empty expanses of ocean until a lookout saw land. Radar was developed during the Second World War to provide radio beacons to mark the coastlines of the world and now, by whatever means, GPS provides a fairly accurate referencing system across the whole world. Most modern navigators rely on GPS, but any good navigator will at least have a working knowledge of the lights in the sky for emergencies. The sun, the moon and the stars all follow very precise patterns in the sky. And if you know where they are at any point in time, they can be used to calculate exactly where you are. Navigation needs only to head in the direction in which the compass is pointing and use the sun, moon and stars as markers to check that you don't stray too far from your planned course. Knowing where each of them are for any particular time and date has long been calculated by the astronomical and naval institutions of the world and to find where they are on any particular time and date we use an ephemeris. No, not a feminist, an ephemeris. An ephemeris is a detailed set of tables from which a navigator can calculate their position anywhere on the earth. Unfortunately, and because the sky is constantly moving, it requires some 20 odd calculations for every single position and hence the need for good navigators on the oceans. During daylight hours, navigation is reliant on the sun and occasionally the moon. At night, the stars provide so much more information, but the calculations are still subject to mistakes. So in 1975, Mr. William Eisenhower patented his universal planisphere complete guidance and computer system. It looks rather complicated, so let's simplify it a little. Essentially, it's a series of disks that are riveted together so they can rotate over each other. The principal disks show the sun and the moon positions in the sky, 
and two discs show the principal stars and constellations in the night sky. Another disc shows the surface of the Earth and the principal land masses. If you look closely, you'll recognise the land masses match those that are shown on the familiar AE map. In other words, the AE map and its relative proportions are considered to be accurate enough for the purposes of world navigation. Despite this only having been invented in the 1970s, this navigation tool became obsolete when GPS was rolled out in the 1990s. It did go into production for a short time, but I was only able to find one that is still in existence. The plans here can be found on the original patent application, but they don't do it much justice, so I figured it might be nice to see what a real one looks like. It measures 16 inches across, so as you can probably imagine, it doesn't contain, nor does it need to show, any inland details. For all practical purposes, it needs only to show the coastlines of the world continents. Remember, ships stop when they reach the land. For anyone who takes a moment to look at the patent application, you'll read that it can be used to show which lights in the sky are above which points on the Earth, and conversely, which points on the Earth are below the various lights in the sky. It shows what the sky looks like from the ground. So, in closing, the flat, circular map of the world seems to have a fairly reliable track record for the purposes of navigation around the world when coupled with the lights that we all see in the sky. Given that one quarter of our world is still effectively out of bounds, this is certainly not an assertion by me that this is what a full map of the world looks like, but it does seem to add one more piece to the puzzle. If you believe that the world is flat, I would suggest that the flat, circular layout provides an accurate indication of how the various continents are placed in relation to each other, but that's your decision to make. The lights in the sky can tell us nothing in themselves of the shape of the Earth, but they certainly do provide us with a reliable reference system. Perhaps the lights in the sky have more to tell us. Thank you for listening.